Hello everybody, this is Fernando for the latest Mysteries and Disappearances video. Alright, let's go ahead and let's do another new entry here. This one coming from a website that highlights 15 of the most mysterious disappearances, either within the past 100 years or so. This one has to do with the disappearance of a poor young woman, someone who basically disappeared off the face of the earth while going on a hiking route. There's been several theories associated with her disappearance. I'll highlight those here uh, towards the end of the video and then I'll give my thought on that as well. But the reason I wanted to pick this one here has to do with so many circumstances, tiny circumstances that I was reading that could have easily changed her unexplained disappearance. Meaning if but for the fact, and you'll hear that said throughout several times in this video, if any one of those items could have gone a different way, then it could have turned out very easily that she did didn't disappear and basically was never seen again. But you're looking at a photograph of her now. In fact, this was the photograph that was used in circulation for her disappearance. It has to do with the disappearance of Paula Jean Weldon. So let's go ahead and let's talk about that info here. Again, I'll give my thoughts on it afterwards. I'll have to hear what your own thoughts are on this disappearance too. So here's what happened. Paula Jean Weldon was born back on October 19, 1928. She was born to a prominent uh, family, like in this case, the father, a guy by the name of William Archibald Weldon, and then his wife, Jean Douglas. He was someone that was very well known either within that area or overall at the time. He was someone that was an architect, an industrial engineer, and then also a designer of various family household items, household utensils as well. I don't know if this was something that was, let's say, just local to the area or more known nationwide, but those included things like cocktail shakers and then other items found throughout households. So in other words, that family was well known and she in turn was also well known because of having that family name or that family legacy. Well, once it came time for her to go to college, she decided to go to an area there called Bennington College, which is still there to this very day, located at North Bennington, Vermont. In fact, her dormitory was at a place called the Dewey House, which you're looking at a picture of it here. And this was the dormitory that she was utilizing while she was on those grounds. She was there, I believe uh, at the time she was a sophomore when it came to her disappearance, but she worked there as well. And then she would just basically traveled throughout the area as well, which could also lead to the next thing in terms of her disappearance. Here's what happened. Apparently, there's an area there near that Vermont location called Long Trail. Somebody might have to let me know about that um, if it's nearby North Bennington, if you know what that is. Apparently, it's the longest trail, hiking trail, within the United States. Like in total, it's over 200 miles or 200 kilometers long. Obviously, most people that live there in the North Bennington area will only walk a shorter distance, but technically that remains the longest trail within the United States, the hiking route, in other words. As it happens, it was just a little bit, like a few miles away from her campus. She must have heard about it sometime in the past, or who knows, maybe when she moved there, that's when she heard about that trail. And so she decided to actually try it out. That was one of the first instances of, you know, if but for the fact, if she hadn't had heard about that trail, who knows where that could have led to uh, her basically not disappearing from the face of the earth. On top of that, she was trying to get some of her other friends within that college, which by the way was a, uh, it, and it still is to this day, it's a young private woman's college. And that's where she was. That's where she was again staying at, at least up to the sophomore status. Well, she was trying to invite some of her friends to join her on that very same walk. But they, in turn, stated they were busy. Again, another instance of if but for the fact, if even one of them would essentially have said yes or wasn't busy that day, who knows how things would have turned out. So she was still resolved in taking that trail. So she decided to do it by herself. 
And then that's where the infamous day happened. This was December 1st, 1946, to be specific. When she finished her shift over at the college, apparently she was working there in the dining hall. She went back into the dorm and she decided to change into regular walking clothes. She decided then to just go as is, not packing any bags, not doing anything else not even taking any extra money. The whole idea was that she was just going to be gone for just a little bit, a couple of hours at most. So why bother, right? What people have noted, though, is that later on that night, there was a big drop in temperature. And so that could have easily caused a uh, more horrible circumstance later on with her disappearance. But there's no idea if she would have known this or not. So she decided to then walk away from the campus. Then somewhere there, she took a hitchhiking route. There was a local contract by the name of Lewis Knapp, who picked her up and then drove her as far away as her house, which was about two and a half miles from the long trail. Overall, I think the trail itself was about maybe four miles from her area. And so she decided to go there after she was dropped off and then basically hitchhiked or walked the rest of the way to the very start of the trail to an area called Woodford Hollow. Now, this is where it leads to the next step, what could be some of the last people that basically saw her alive or basically saw her before she disappeared. As she was walking up that trail, she was again by herself, remember? She saw that uh, there was a group of hikers and she in turn approached them. These may be the very last people to have seen her, but more on that here in a minute with far, as far as someone else that could have seen her as well. She talked to them and then asked them a qu couple of questions about the trail, I'm guessing because this was the first time again that she was there. And then after that, she just continued walking away in a northerly direction and then probably the last area that she was seen at was a place near Harbor Road. So this was again now an area that was much more isolated and this was now at a time where it was coming into late in the afternoon and at that time of the, of the, of the season or of the year darkness would be much quicker or much earlier than the rest of the year. And so at that perfect time, in other words, of disaster. She was out there on her own. The last few people who have seen her were walking away from her. And then light was slowly but surely getting dimmer and dimmer. And now this would have involved the woods around her just com being completely pitch black or getting much darker, much quicker than anticipated. And in fact, the last known sighting that she could have been at, like presumed area, was an area called Fay Fuller Camp. And But there, unfortunately, there have been no other people that have come forward stating that they saw her around that area. The only ones were, again, those group of hikers that later on were approached and they were the ones that pointed out as far as her being on the missing persons program. But in the next day, when she didn't return to that campus, that's when her roommate, thinking that she might have gone to the library, thought everything was still okay. But then the next morning when she still didn't show up, obviously something was amiss. She was gone. And so that's when the college administrators of that college were notified. And then they started searching the campus. And then that's when, once again, of course, with the family having that prominent name, um, other people started to get into the mix as well. There was a state's attorney office that was also notified. There was the sheriff that was also brought in as well. And this started to grow more and more. In fact, over the next several weeks, and at one point, in fact, that Bennington College was closed for a couple of days, there was an intensive search. There was hundreds of people that were involved. There were students, there were faculty, National Guard was brought in as well. There were firefighters, there were family members, there were also uh, searches through the air as well. This was all done, again, combing along that area, combing along that Route 9, going through that Harbor Road area as well, all of them looking into the woods to try to see what could have happened to her. But unfortunately, at that point, and even up to this day, not a single trace of her existence has ever been found. Pretty much what had happened was once she got on that road, um, as far as, you know, beginning hitchhiked and then 
going towards the start of that trail and then running into those group of hikers. That was it. Once she was seen basically heading off into that northerly direction towards that isolated trail, which, by the way, would have ended. At that point, at the end of Harbor Road, it would have cut off. Um, there would have been no other road to continue. It's just pure woods at that point. Then presumably she would have gone even further, and that's when she would have been in those pitch black dark woods all by herself and then getting into that cold, cold temperature. So, But yeah, there was a huge investigation that was done and that led to some speculation like what happened to her? Why did she disappear? There's this theory. One was that she decided to run away, that she decided to start a whole new life. Some of it may even involve the secret lover, someone that she was eloping with, something along those lines. Or another theory is that she was actually committing, uh, I can't really say that word, on YouTube because it gets banned, but imagine that she was ending her life. And so when that happened, that's where she decided to go out into the woods, and then that's where she met her fate. Others on the more darker, sinister side stated that she was kidnapped or she was outright murdered, but there was no clues, like nothing indicating that. And then also nobody, again, holding any information as far as ransom, because that was another theory as well. With the prominent family name and the money that they had, there was some theories that someone was holding her ransom, but nobody ever came forward with that. And then another theory involves her getting lost in the woods and then falling and then having some injury or hitting her head somewhere and you know not being able to recuperate from it. There's all those theories, but unfortunately, nothing points towards the right direction. The closest thing that investigation investigators and their investigation led to was this. And even then, this is almost grasping at straws, but I can kind of see why this person remained of interest. There was a lumberjack, a guy by the name of Fred Gadette, who apparently was in that same area, living around an area of Harbor Road. I don't know how far into that location he was compared to where she was found. But the going theory is this. At one point, he was there right on that same day, right at the same time as she was walking by. He was there with his girlfriend and they were having a huge argument, a very, very nasty one. And so he stormed off in a complete rage right at that point when she, in other words, Paula Jean Weldon, was walking by. And so when that happens, that's when he claims, because he was led here, uh, asked by authorities and investigators, what did he do? He gave two, two separate um, explanations. One was that he, once he stormed off, he just spent the evening by himself doing nothing else. And another one was that he drove up part of that trail, which was the same area, the same location, same direction that Paula Jean Weldon was going as well. And so that theory points to him as being as a person of interest. And this was investigated once in 1946 and then once again in 1952. What really caught those investigators' uh, ears was the fact that he apparently told two people, two other uh, people that he must have known, that he knew where she was buried. But at the same time, he was also telling him that it was just as he described that idle talk, like it was just him boasting something, but that he didn't do anything. It was just creating some weird fabrication. Who does that, right? Like who would basically joke about something like that? But apparently he did. The only thing that saved him, though, was the fact that no single shred of evidence was ever found linking him to that crime. Nothing indicating forensic clues, no body, nothing at all. So despite the fact that he was a person of interest and he could have truly been the very last person to have seen Paula Jean Weldon, meaning he's the one that did something to her, uh, nothing was ever directly linked to him. And then that was it. That was the closest other theory as to what happened to her. But then that's it. After that, whenever she disappeared again on December 1st, 1946, there has been nothing else ever since then. And we're talking about a trail, again, that has been uh, who knows how many hundreds, if not thousands of people have gone through it over the past, what, 80 years or so. So you would think that by now somebody would have found something or who knows, maybe something might turn up later on, too. But it, well, if, if it does at least um, show some indication of what this area is like and the mysteriousness associated with it, there have been ever since her disappearance, at least four other 
unexplained disappearances as well. These occurred between 1945 and 1950, and that area for a little while became known as the Bennington Triangle, uh, which was a uh, throwback to the Bermuda Triangle. The fact that here you have a location that is causing these disappearances, but there are no indications as to what he could have done. But unfortunately for this poor young woman, Paula Jean Weldon, as I mentioned at the beginning, there's a lot of, of, of if but for the facts. One is if she hadn't decided to just try on a whim to finally take that long trail, or if her friends, her students, one of them would have at least joined her, that could have been led things to a whole different path. Or again, those hitchhikers, if they in turn would have told her something, I guess when she asked them questions and she decided, you know what, I'm not going to take that long trail, that would have been another one. And then finally, if you go by the theory that you had that lumberjack, Fred Gadet, causing her disappearance, if she hadn't had walked by that area at the very split moment when he was in that rage, when he had that argument with his girlfriend, maybe if it was five minutes later, five minutes earlier, then that could have led to a whole different circumstance too. But let me know what you guys think. Post in the comments below about this disappearance. Anyone there from that area, from that Vermont location? Um, if so, if you're from Bennington, uh, I'd love to hear what your thoughts are if you know more info on the local level as well. All right, everybody. Thanks again as always. Take care.